Griffin. This is week two. And this week we are discussing medical terminology and anatomy review. So if you could turn with me to your textbooks to page 33, the start of chapter two. And I'd like to draw your attention to a few things before getting started with the lecture. Throughout this chapter, you are going to have a breakdown of each organ system, starting with the integumentary, musculoskeletal, and et cetera. And uh, frequent medical terms or common terms, word roots, prefixes, and suffixes, which are all the three elements that um, are combined to make a medical term. You're going to have um, a breakdown of each of those things for each body system. So what I would like for you to do is, as you're studying and reading this chapter this week, um, to make index cards. And with those index cards, I would love for you to um, just break those down by organ system. You can go to your closest Dollar Tree, Family Dollar, or even Walmart and get some blank index cards. And they also sell uh, the rings that you can have to kind of clamp them together and just get a hole puncher. And that way you can um, create cards for uh, basically each chapter or each organ system. And I feel like that is going to greatly help you as you're writing and reading uh, to be able to retain the information and start really becoming familiar with those terms. Um, also, at the end of chapter two in each chapter in the textbook, you're also going to see um, terms throughout vocabulary terms. Um, I also would like for you to make index cards out of those. So ultimately in the end, you're gonna have lots of index cards, but that is going to be um, you creating your own study tools. So I just wanted to share that with everyone before going into the lecture today for the medical terminology and anatomy review. This PowerPoint presentation is approximately 40 uh, 40 to 41 slides. So the lecture will be about an hour. And in this time frame, um, we're going to focus on three main objectives. Objective one is we're going to talk about word elements. Objective two, we're going to discuss diagnostic and procedural terms. And objective three, uh, we're going to also discuss anatomy. In this chapter, um, I want to start with medical terminology. And um, as you know, medical terminology is the language of medicine. This is something that we discussed during our live time um, together on the class on Tuesday. But every profession, no matter what it is, has its own language. Language. If you're a cashier, then you talk about, you know, making sure your your till is balanced, your till being your your cash drawer, your register. Um, you talk about debits and credits, returns and um, balancing and, and um, consolidation and all of those things. So just as you have that with that type of career path or um, maybe working in finance, you have medical terminology. Um, medicine is no exception and the language is very unique in medicine um, because it is derived from Latin and Greek terms. So one of the terms that it first introduced us to is PRN. Um, PRN is an abbreviation for pro re nada, which means when necessary. So you may have heard it in your past um, when you were prescribed medications and your physician maybe said, take this medication as needed or take PRN. If you look at your pill bottle, it'll have PRN um, on there. And there's other abbreviations that um, or other letters that you may not know are also abbreviations that relate to uh, medical terminology. Like, um, like for example, uh, PO means by mouth, take by mouth. Um, so we're gonna talk about some of these specifically with each body area, but first let's introduce you to the, the makeup of a general medical term. So if you're in your textbook, you can look at page th 33. Um, and in page 33, top right, they have an example box. And in that example box, it's showing you a medical term and the genetic makeup of, of that term. But every medical term has 
um, can have up to three parts. It's going to always have a word root. That word root is going to identify which body part or what body area uh, that the term is referring to. For example, you may see derm O, which refers to skin, um, but you may be familiar with the medical term dermatitis. So that means it's a word root that's combined with the suffix, but notice that the O has been dropped. That O is a combining vowel, so it's only used if it's needed to combine two word roots. Um, like for example, cardiovascular, as you can see here, because you have a compound word, meaning you have two word roots, cardio referring to the heart, vasculo referring to the vessel. Same with the um, nephrolithiasis. You have nephro that's referring to the kidney, but the O was also used here and kept to separate the kidney from the actual um, condition affecting the kidney, which is a lithiasis or stone. So this term is used for kidney stone. So again, you're always going to have a word root that identifies your body part or area that is being uh, referenced with that medical term. Um, you may also have a prefix, pre, as in beginning or before. The prefix is always going to be found before um, the word root, and it can be um, indicative of a number. It could be uh, representing a color. For example, uh, tri meaning three, like if someone is having a triple, even the word triple has tri in it. Um, that indicates to us that it's referencing three. And then cyano refers to blue. So I use the example in class um, on Tuesday night that if a patient is suffering from cyanosis, which means they're having a lack of oxygen, that means they're blue in the face. So that that diagnosis of cyanosis um, is an indicator that the patient has a blue tint to their skin, meaning um, they are suffering from a lack of oxygen. So that's one way. Um, other prefixes that uh, reference numbers, mono, mono meaning one, um, bi, B-I, bi is a prefix that means two. So if someone has bilateral pain in both knees, for example, that means they have pain in their left knee and pain in their right knee. Um, suffixes. Suffixes are attached to the end of a word. Frequently, they indicate the condition, the disorder, or the disease that the person is having. Um, but they can also indicate the or reference the um, type of surgical procedure that someone is having. So there's a couple of things that I'm going to show you in the upcoming weeks of list of um, suffixes that reference surgical procedures. You'll see that in chapter six, um, but also a list of um, all of the things here within chapter two, the word root, the prefixes um, that you're going to see for each organ system. So let's talk about um, two very common suffixes that you'll see. One that means surgical removal is ectomy. You'll find it as a suffix at the end of a word. Um, for example, if someone is having a hysterectomy, that means they're having their uterus removed. So the word root that references the body part of uterus is hystero, and then ectomy is the suffix. So when you put them together, you get the term hysterectomy, meaning surgical removal of the uterus. Um, another example would be tonsil tonsillectomy, meaning someone is having their tonsils removed. Thyroidectomy, meaning someone is having their thyroid removed. Um, mastectomy, masto refers to the breast. Masto is the word root for breast. So if they're having uh, breast removal, the term that's utilized is mastectomy. Um, so those are some pretty common ones that you may have heard before. Another suffix that you've probably heard before is itis. <laughs> itis is a very, very common suffix um, that we see attached to the term inflammation. It can mean inflammation or infection, one and the same. Um, 
and you will see itis at the end of that term, dermatitis, inflammation of the skin, cellulitis, inflammation of the fat cells within the skin, um, arthritis, inflammation of the joints. Um, meningitis, um, inflammation that is uh, lives within your spinal cavity. Um, so many I can name gastritis, inflammation of the stomach. So as you can see, itis is going to be probably one of the more common ones that you start to remember. The more that you can charge to memory, the better off you're going to be in the end. Um, I talk about coding when we actually begin the coding part. That coding is based off of concepts, but terminology certainly is and, and you know, can, should be, should charge to your memory. Um, to some extent, even though there's areas within the coding book that you will have to use during the coding exam that you can find the answers that you need um, for not only terminology, but for anatomy and physiology. So anatomy um, definition is the structure of the body parts and their relationship to each other. That means um, every what we're going to see is every organ system has um, specific body parts that are located to function within that organ system. Like, for example, you have the digestive system, which is your uh, mouth, your esophagus, your stomach, your intestines. Um, then you have the respiratory system, which is your nose, your your um, bronchioles, your lungs. Um, you have the musculoskeletal, which is your um, bones and your muscles and tendons and um, other what they call connective tissue. So we're start we're going to begin to learn like all of the organs and the anatomy of these organ systems um, going forward. And it's going to be broken down, um, generalized in chapter two as your introduction, but it's going to be more detailed and broken down as we begin to study each organ system going forward. Physiology, um, which is a term that is often used in conjunction to anatomy, is the function of the body and how the body parts work to carry out their life-sustaining activities. Meaning every organ or body part has a function, has a purpose. So we're gonna not only learn um, where those things are located in the body, the anatomy and structure of them, but we're also going to learn about their function or physiology. Organs. Um, organs are muscle, muscle tissue or multiple tissue types formed together to perform a specific function for the body. So think back to a biology class you may have taken uh, maybe a long, long time ago. And the, the makeup, a structural makeup of an organ is um, we have to start all the way down at the um, atomic level, an atom. An atom is like one of the smallest pieces of matter um, that we have. A group of atoms make a cell. A group of cells form together to make tissue. A group of tissues come together to make an organ and a group of organs is referred to as an organ system. So an organ system is a collection of body parts depending on one another to achieve a mutual objective. For example, a respiratory system. You have to have a nose in order to take in the air for the process of, um, for the process of the oxygen and carbon dioxide to be converted so that our body can use it and uh, receive the oxygen that we need, correct? So it takes all of those collective parts to work together and depend on each other um, to achieve their ultimate function. In this chapter, we're going to discuss a brief overview of the organ systems. Um, each organ system is also discussed in subsequent chapters as it pertains to that particular chapter. So the systems we're going to talk about are the integumentary, which is the skin, um, the musculoskeletal, cardiovascular, lymphatic, respiratory, digestive, urinary, reproductive, nervous system, organs of sense, which is our eyes and ears, 
um, the endocrine system, hematologic, and immune system. But first, let's talk about uh, anatomical positions. So as we go forward into um, coding surgeries, it's going to be important to be able to identify when we're talking about anatomy, if um, they're using terms to say, for example, our heart is located superior or superiorly to our stomach because the heart is above the stomach. Notice the arrow pointing upward. Anything that's super is gonna be high, right? Or greater. So your heart is above your stomach, but um, your foot is inferior to your knees because your, your feet are below your knees. So those are some directional terms that you're gonna see used um, perhaps in maybe questions or even when we start coding operations and surgeries you'll see documentation listed in your op notes. That's gonna be um, indicators to let you know um, where things are anatomically positioned. So let's get a breakdown of some of the organ systems that we'll be um, identifying, just to look at some of the body parts located within them. Um, we're gonna start with the integumentary system, which consists of skin, hair, nails, and also includes the breast um, because our breasts are mainly made of skin and fatty tissue. Um, these structures work together to provide protection from injury, fluid loss, as well as outside elements such as bacteria and viruses. So they're, they protect us. Um, they also provide body temperature regulation, fluid balance, and sensation. So if you're looking in your textbook, again, page 33 has a list of um, integumentary system word roots that are going to be beneficial for you to know going forward. Um, as far as layers of the skin, so this is an illustration of a skin cell, and there are two layers that make up the human skin, the dermis and the epidermis. So we talked about the three layers, but you can see here the dermis is the, the largest portion of a skin cell. The epidermis, prefix epi meaning above or on top, is the top layer of the skin, and then you have the subcutaneous layer. So I, I stress sub because the, the prefix of sub means below. So the subcutaneous layer is just beneath the skin and is composed of fatty tissue. So think about, I like to use chicken as an example, raw chicken. And think about when you're cleaning a chicken and how you have the chicken skin on the top, um, then, you know, there's that clear film underneath, and then you got to have the chicken fat. Um, so that should, you know, really paint a good picture of, um, how our human skin is as well. And of course you have your accessory organs or parts located within the skin, um, because there's your hair, here's the hair follicles, um, or the hair shaft. And then the nerves, veins, arteries, um, I mentioned the hair follicle, you can see that there, sebaceous glands, um, sweat glands. So all of that is also, you know, a part of the integumentary system. Um, why it's gonna be important to understand the anatomy of the integumentary is because when we start doing surgery coding, this is a CPT code. So this CPT code, describes a surgery that was performed on uh, the subcutaneous tissue of the skin. So remember the subcutaneous is below the dermis and epidermis. So if they're doing a procedure on the subcutaneous tissue, it's gonna include the epidermis and dermis because they had to grow, go through that area in order to get to, in order to get to the, the subcutaneous. So just going back to our illustration one more time, here's our subcutaneous. So if this is the target area of the procedure, the only way for them to get to the subcutaneous tissue is if they cut through the dermis, cut through the, I'm sorry, through the epidermis, through the dermis, and then they'll be able to access the subcutaneous tissue. So that's what this um, surgery code right here is describing. And another thing with the skin surgeries as well is they are 
measured um, or they're identified by site. So it may be subcutaneous tissue of the arm, of the leg, of the um, you know specific area, but also by size. So it's it's saying that this was specifically for um, up to 20 square centimeters or less. But we'll get into that detail with chapter seven when we do the integumentary system. Um, the nail unit is made up of six parts and the root is the part that extends out of the skin. So we're seeing, we see our nail root. The nail bed is the area of the nail that lays on, that, that it lays on and extends from the lunula, lun, lunula <laughs> to the hypenicheum. This is the pink part of your nail, which gets its color from blood vessels, um, nerves, and melanocytes. So our, our melanin plays a part in that as well. The nail plate is the actual nail made of translucent keratin. We've heard that term. The epicon, epinicheum is the cuticle. The perionicheum is the skin around the nail and is the site of hangnails, ingrown nails, and infection of the skin around the nail called perinicia. The hyponicium is the junction between the free edge of the nail and the skin. So a term you'll want to become familiar with um, for nails is subungual, subungual, S-U-B-U-N-G-U-A-L, which means under the nail, sub meaning under or below, ungual below the nail. Um, and you'll see that again once we start chapter seven with the surgery coding, um, because there's a procedure called evacuation of a subungual hematoma. Say you go to a nail shop, you get a um, your nail gets bruised, you got a collection of blood under your fingernail, they have to remove that, you know, if it get, becomes bad enough, painful or infected. And um, the procedure that they would do for that is an evacuation of that hematoma or that blood clot. That's what a, a hematoma is. So the musculoskeletal system consists of bones, muscles, joints, tendons, and ligaments. And their main purpose is for movement, strength, form, protection, and heat. Bones also serve as a production factory for blood cells and store calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium salts. The muscle provides the form and heat for the body. So it's going to be important to know down the line that bones is where the formation of our blood cells begin. Um, there are five types of bones. You have our long tubular bones that are longer than they are wide. So like our femur and our, our thigh, our femur, that's the longest bone in the body. Um, your short cuboidal bones are shaped like a cube, tend to have those um, in our wrist. The carpal bones of the wrist and the tarsal bones of the ankle are short cuboidal. Our sesamoid bones are shaped like a sesame seed and can be found embedded in tendons and in joints. Um, there are also two sesamoid bones in the ball of our foot beneath the big toe joint and the patella in the knee is the largest uh, sesamoid bone, bone. Flat bones. Flat bones have a layer of spongy bone between two layers of compact bone and the cross section is flat and not rounded. So our, our ribs are flat bones as well as um, our skull, those are flat bones. If you look at the illustration or picture of a skull, you can kind of see if you were to take it apart, even a skeleton, that the, the bones are actually flat. Irregular bones are bones that do not fit in other categories. So um, two examples are vertebrae are irregular bones because they have their own um, shape and as well as our coccyx, the tailbone is an irregular bone. Cartilage and joints. Cartilage is a, a type of flexible connective tissue that is non-vascular, so it doesn't have blood vessels in it. Again, think about a chicken leg, a chicken bone. Um, chicken cartilage does not bleed. 
cartilage is a matrix of chondrocytes, collagen, and cells called proteoglycans, and depending on the type of cartilage. Um, joints, joints and articulating surfaces are synonymous and provide a connection between two or more parts of the skeleton. So elbows, knees, hips, ankles, um, shoulders. Those are, those are joints. Um, joints are classified according to the type of connective tissue at the articulating surfaces. And the three types of joints are fibrous, cartilaginous, and synovial, which most joints are synovial, like your, your shoulder. Um, your knees are examples of synovial joints because they have synovial fluid in them that keeps them moving um, as they should. And if anyone has had knee problems or knee issues, you could either have too much <laughs> fluid or you could have not enough. Um, and either way, it will cause you issues, the similar issues. Um, the skeleton, the human skeleton is divided into two parts, the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. The axial skeleton contains the skull, spine, ribs, and sternum along with the sacrum and protects your vital organs. So skull protects your brain, the spine protects your nerves, the ribs protect your lungs, the sternum is in your chest and it protects your heart, and the sacrum is in the pelvic area. Uh, the appendicular skeleton is your extremities and the girdles that connect them. So that would be your shoulder girdle, your pelvic girdle, and your other extremities, arms and legs, feet and hands are also part of that. Muscles have the property of contractility. They also provide form and produce heat for the body. There are three types of muscles, skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. So the skeletal muscles are also referred to as um, striated muscles. You may have heard this term before. Um, they help to move the skeleton. They're attached by tendons. Cardiac muscle is the heart muscle. It is an involuntary muscle, meaning that it pumps blood throughout the body all the time. We don't have to tell it to pump. It just does um, involuntarily. And smooth, um, smooth muscles is found in the walls of hollow organs of the body, like the esophagus that moves food down our throat to the stomach, um, the bladder that contracts or moves to control urine flow, as well as the intestines that contract and move to um, push out fecal matter. The lymphatic system, I'm sorry, the cardiovascular system um, is made up of the heart and blood vessels and the heart pumps to move blood throughout the body. Um, also with in aiding with the pulmonary circulation and um, systematic or systemic circulation. So pulmonary meaning oxygen um, to and from the lungs in the remaining part of the body. The heart is composed of three layers, the epicardium, which is the outer lining, the myocardium, which is the main heart muscle. Myo is the prefix for muscle and the um, the endocardium. So are your blood vessels, there are three types of blood vessels. Um, the arteries that take blood away from the heart, and you can remember that just by the first letter in arteries and the first letter in away. So arteries take blood away from the heart. Veins take blood back to the heart. And um, capillaries are tiny semi-permeal vessels that facilitate the exchange of fluids, oxygen, nutrients, and waste between local tissues in the bloodstream. Coronary artery bypass grafts can be created using veins or arteries. That's chapter 10 for us when we start to get into the breakdown of that. Um, the lymphatic system includes a network of vessels um, that transport fluids. The lymphatic system is important to our body's defense um, system and it's resistant to disease. So this is why our lymph nodes react anytime we get sick. Um, the lymph vessels and nodes collect excess fluid 
from interstitial spaces and return it to the heart using a series of valves. Um, lymphoid organs include the spleen, thymus, tonsils, and the pyres patches of the intestines. It's amazing. We have lymph nodes loaded, located all throughout our bodies. Um, and I shared with the class one of the things that uh, really may drive home how this could make sense um, to everyone, or you can just apply it to your you know, everyday life is when we get sick, the first thing a doctor tells us is to make sure we drink a lot of fluids. That is because the more fluids we intake, the more we initiate um, the process of fluid transfer within our lymphatic system that helps push whatever infection or infectious agent um, is fighting our body at the time. So the lymphatic system really works along with the immune system, um, which we'll talk about here in a few. The respiratory system. As you can see, lots of organs, lots of um, additional tiny parts within our lungs. Um, so the respiratory system, also known as the pulmonary system, includes the nose, nasal cavity, um, the pharynx, larynx, bronchi, and their smaller bronchioles, lungs, and the alveoli all played a special role. The respiratory system functions to swap carbon dioxide for oxygen. This gas exchange occurs through the permeable membranes of the alveoli. Uh, the digestive system is the feeding tube that begins in the mouth and ends at the anus. The structure winds its way through several body cavities and it encompasses a multitude of structures and organs that mechanically and chemically break down food for absorption into the bloodstream and uses it at the cellular level. So let's talk first about the stomach because the stomach has four parts. There's the um, cardiac orifice, the fundus, which is the rounded um, upper portion of the stomach and the body of the main stomach. Uh, the body is the main stomach or main portion <laughs> of our stomach, and then we have the um, pyloric antrum, which is located in the lower portion of the stomach. Um, with the small intestine, it's also um, small, but it's big, it's long. Um, the small intestine is divided into three sections. It has the first one third of the small intestine is called the duodenum. Um, the second one third is the jejunum, and the fourth is the ileum. So there is also another body part that is called the ileum. Um, one is a bone and the other is the intestine. So the way that you can just remember this one for now is that there's an E in the word intestine, two E's actually, and then there's one E in this word ileum, I-L-E-U-M. So also with duodenum, there's an E, with jejunum, there's an E. So I always just try to remember that these are spelled with the letter E because the other ileum is spelled with the letter I and it refers to the hip bone. So, um, ileum, small intestines, E, letter E. The large intestine, so this is the, the one where if you're having a colonoscopy, this is where they're inserting the scope. Um, the large intestine begins just at the ileocecal valve, at the cecum with the appendix attached at the bottom. Um, appendix can, you know, make or break you um, if it becomes infected or inflamed and ruptures fecal matter into your body. So it is a part of the large intestine. Um, there are four portions to the colon. Well, hold on. Ileal valve at the cecum with the appendix attached at the bottom. Then after the appendix is the colon, the rectum, and the anal canal. Um, there are four portions to the colon. You have the ascending colon. Think directional terms. Once again, if something is ascending, it's, it's, it's up. Um, the ascending proceeds from the ileocecal valve upward to the hepatic flexure, so going towards the direction of the liver. Um, it becomes the transverse colon. And then it turns downward and becomes the descending. The word descending means going down. 
colon at the splenic flexure, and then the descending colon gives way to the sigmoid colon and ends at the rectum. The internal and external anal sphincters at the terminus of the rectum control the flow of fecal material leaving the body. This is going to be one of the later chapters that we uh, discuss, but it's good to hear the terms now. So if someone is having a, a, a procedure on their intestines where um, it requires the doctors to use a scope or insert a scope, they're either going to have a proctal sigmoidoscopy, which the scope only examines the rectum and the sigmoid um, colon portion, which is if you insert it through the anus would be the first two areas. Um, then you have a sigmoidoscopy, which would examine the rectum sigmoid in a portion of the descendant with descending. And then um, a full colonoscopy would examine the entire colon from the rectum at the at the end or at the bottom all the way to the cecum near where the appendix is. So when they insert the, the camera or the scope, it's going in uh, bottom first and, and being pushed up to the top. Um, urine production, the urinary system is primarily responsible for the production of urine. Um, for the excretion of metabolic waste, along with fluid and electrolyte balance, structures of the urinary system include the kidneys, ureters, the urinary bladder, and the urethra. Um, a urinary calculi or a stone can exist anywhere within the urinary system, so a kidney stone. Uh, well, it says anywhere, but the diagnostic and procedural coding are both dependent on where in the urinary system the stone exists. So it really could be in any part of these areas because it has to pass through. If it's in your urine, it has to pass through all of these areas to get out of your body. Um, it just may be that the most common is the kidneys, which is the starting point, but it has to go through the ure ureter, through the bladder, and through the urethra to ultimately find its way out of our bodies. Um, when we talk about the female and, and male genitalia, it, it's going to actually be two separate chapters. Um, the organs of the reproductive systems differ greatly, obviously, um, but the functions are similar. They both excrete um, hormones, ovaries, as well as testes. Um, but because the genetic makeup of um, male and female are different, females are more likely to get a urinary tract infection just because we have uh, innies and not outies. <laughs> um, so we will spend some time kind of going through these different parts and organs, as well as me showing you where in your coding book you can identify and find um, not only the terms, but their function as well, the anatomy and the physiology. Um, our nervous system provides three general functions, sensory, integrative, and motor skills or motor functions. Um, the nervous system helps us to feel, think, remember, move, and be aware of the, round, the world around us. It is divided into two groups. You have your central nervous system, which consists of the brain and the spinal cords. And then you have your peripheral nervous system, which consists of cranial nerves and spinal nerves. So cranial nerves are the ones that stem from the brain, cranial, cranium, brain, um, and the spinal nerves stem from the spine. The nervous system functions um, as a central operator and central intelligence for the body, and it detects changes outside and within the body. Um, it helps us make decisions based on the information that it receives and stimulates muscles or glands to um, to respond. So if you've been following along in the chapter as I've been lecturing and feel free to um, pause or go back, you can actually hit the go back button. I'm currently on page 61 um, to correspond with the textbook uh, for the nervous system. And again, you can see that there's specific terms for the nervous system. There are, um, applications to documentation. So there's tips all throughout the chapter. 
um, that's going to be able to help you with each organ system. Um, organs of sense are classified as a subsection of the organ system because of the nervous system, excuse me. Um, the sensory organs receive and filter sensory input. <coughs> excuse me. That is interpreted in the central nervous system and organs of the sense include our eyes and ears. So first the eyes um, is the sensory organ of sight. The eyeball is made up of three layers. We have a retina, a choroid, and a sclera. So in parentheses, it basically tells you their genetic makeup that uh, the retina is mainly made of nerves. The choroid is mainly made of um, blood vessels and the sclera is a fiber fibrous tissue. Uh, the eyeball is separated into an anterior segment and filled with aqueous humor and a posterior segment filled with vitreous humor. Um, going to be an important detail to know when we again begin surgery coding for the eye. The crystalline lens separates those two segments and the aqueous humor is responsible for um, eye pressure, intraocular eye pressure. The ventreous humor shares in the responsibility for that intraocular eye pressure, um, but also prevents our eyeballs from collapsing. One of the most common procedures on the eye is actually on the muscle that controls the eye movement instead of the actual eyeball itself. And that is the strabismus surgery, which is performed by shortening or lengthening various muscles of the eye. Our ears are our sensory organ of hearing, as well as um, controlling our sense of equilibrium. It works in conjunction with the auditory nerves to send auditory impulses to the temporal lobes of the cerebrum, so to our brain. And these structures working together form the auditory apparatus. These are, um, or there are three distinct and separate anatomical divisions of the ear. The outer ear, which is the obvious outer. The middle ear, which is our tympanic cavity containing the um, eardrum. And then, the, I'm sorry, the middle ear um, has the eardrum. And then the inner ear is called the laboring. Also with the eustachian tube, you know how you can, can get fluid in your ear? Um, or, you know, when you have sinus drainage and things start to drain um, from your post nasal drip and then you have fluid in your ear, your lymph nodes start to swell, your throat hurts. That's because all of those um, areas are really connected together. The eustachian tube connects each middle ear to your throat. Um, so this is why we have odd, odd, Autology, which is the study of the ear, very specialized field of medicine um, because it provides two services. It provides audiometry services, um, which is examination um, of our ears, you know, hearing test. And then you have the surgical portion of that, the surgery services that are necessary for therapeutic procedures to treat conditions of the ear. Our endocrine system is the system that regulates the functions of the human body to maintain homeostasis um, and is accomplished by the nervous system and the endocrine system working together. So first let's define homeostasis, which is the, the balance of our body, meaning everything is completely balanced, stable. Um, with the endocrine system, because it secretes hormones, that is its main purpose. Hormones could be um, insulin, T3 and T4 from the thyroid, um, progesterone and estrogen for females, puberty to uh, menopause, um, testosterone for men. So that is our endocrine system. If any of those things are not balanced, that means we are not functioning um, in balance or as in homeostasis. That means we're outside of the realm of homeostasis. Uh, most of the, the organs in the endocrine system are glands. Um, glands are ductless, so their home hormones 
um, secrete directly into our blood system. So this is, you know, people who are diabetic, they're getting too much insulin or not enough insulin. Um, but you can inject it and it'll go directly into your system because it goes straight into the bloodstream. Um, the hemic system or hematologic system involves the blood, red blood cells, um, or also known as erythrocytes because that um, prefix of erythro refers to blood and the suffix of cytes, C-Y-T-E-S, refers to cells. Um, with the white blood cells, leuco is white, sites means cells, so you have white cells. And then platelets, um, with placelet, platelets, the uh, word root is thrombo, suffix is sites. So if you have a blood clot, the medical term for a blood clot is a thrombosis. I'm sorry, a thrombus, thrombus which is a blood clot identified to its home location of or caused by platelets, a collection of platelets. Platelets or thrombocytes form clusters to plug small holes in blood vessels and assist in the clotting process. So um, that may be new info for all of you. The immune system is classified as a separate system from the hematologic system. However, most immune cells originate in the hemat hematologic system. Um, often the study of allergies will go hand in hand because an allergic person is actually in, um, uh, an allergy is an immune response. It's your body's way of fighting off or trying to fight off um, against something that's invading it, whether it's a microorganism, a harmful chemical, um, you know, if you have a shellfish allergy and you're, you're allergic to it, your body's going to instantly jump into fight mode. Um, whatever your allergy is, peanut allergy, your body's instantly going to jump into fight mode. So that is um, really what is happening. It is your immune system activating its function. Um, the immune system is made up of two types of cells, B cells and T cells. B cells are created and mature in the bone marrow, hence the letter B. They get activated and produce antibodies that attach to the surface of the infectious agent. T cells identify infectious agents and directly attack, uh, attack them. Both T and B cells are also lymphocytes. Remember the lymphatic system, so these are lymphocytes. Um, other types of white blood cells used by the body for protection include neutrophils, um, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. So if you are having some type of reaction or infection and they do blood work, this is what they're looking at. They're looking at your, the levels of, um, these white blood cells that are fighting on your behalf. When they identify which cell or yeah, which cells are higher in level, that helps them identify the type of infection as well. Antigens and antibodies. So we began to, to begin to hear a lot about this with COVID. Um, when they started talking about if you've had it, then you may have the antibodies, or um, if you may have had the antibody treatment that that um they were offering at some facilities where they would infuse um, COVID antibodies into you via an IV, um, and that would help eliminate your symptoms. You would already have COVID. It wouldn't prevent you from getting it, but it would prevent your symptoms from being more severe. So antigens elicit an immune response in the body. Um, antigens that enter the body from the environment includes in inhaled macromolecules, for example, proteins on a cat hair that can cause an asthma attack. That would certainly be for me. Um, ingested molecules or macromolecules are also things that are allergens or um, that may activate an immune response like shellfish, like peanuts. 
Molecules that are introduced beneath the skin, beneath the skin such as um, a splinter. They can also, so antigens are things that would activate or cause your allergic reaction. Antibodies are immune system related proteins called immunoglobulins. And some antibodies destroy antigens directly while others indirectly by making it easier for white blood cells to destroy the antigen. So like an EpiPen, an epinephrine pen is um, giving you a quick jolt, an instant jolt of adrenaline. With the adrenaline, that is kicking you into fight mode, right? So that means your lymphatic system, your immuno system, your antibodies, everything is, is on uh, high alert, is heightened. So that means they know to so automatically activate because this EpiPen just told them, hey, we got to fight something off instantly. Um, so that, that's what happens within our bodies. So just to review, um, we have talked about word elements. We have talked about um, diagnostic and procedural terms as well as anatomy. And this was a really great overview just to kind of get you started. Um, I hope that everyone really just enjoys um, going through and reading through chapter two, making your index cards and really just taking your time with this. Um, not only that, really take advantage of um, free apps that you may have available on your phone. You can search in your free app store, whether you're Android or iPhone and see if there are applications available for medical terminology. That would be helpful, something you could kind of do in your spare time. Um, also, YouTube. Utilize any YouTube link that you feel is going to be helpful to you um, to help you with your medical terminology. Uh, repetition is the key. The more you see it, the more you read it, the more you hear it, the more you you will retain it. Um, so I do encourage you to continue to do that. As always, please reach out to me if you have any questions about anything discussed in this lecture. And I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.